Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples. On, you know, this one is right in between. It's not as nice as yesterday, which wasn't particularly nice anyway. It's not horrible right now, uh, but uh, it's definitely going to get worse. The weather is still basically shit, and it's not really going to improve for the next few weeks, probably. Uh, even if, again, this week has given us a little bit of a reprieve, and uh, the humidity isn't quite as devastating as it normally is. I mean, normally it's just unfit for humans to walk around. It's just the worst of the worst. Right now, eh, you know, it's bad enough, but... It could be much worse. But look, I'm not going to ramble on about the weather as I tend to do because obviously it just isn't what people tune in for. And uh, I'm going to instead get on to the topic of cars, which is what this is theoretically all about. I'm not even going to talk about the deers or the goats or the cats or, you know, the rabbits or any other number of horrible woodland creatures that seem to roam Peter's property and look at me menacingly. And I, I will say this, again, I haven't seen any deer in a while, which is good. Uh, I don't know what's happened to them and I don't really care. I'm just happy they're not around. And uh, there was a rabbit this morning when I turned the sprinklers off, but he darted off and I haven't seen him since. Uh, birds, they've been kind of screaming up in the trees, but uh, maybe they've heard me and for the moment they don't seem to be... Uh, they don't seem to be too loud. And, uh, of course, we're going to keep our eyes on the fire ants now. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm, you know, there we go off on a tangent. Let's get right into this car. Uh, this is a 1994 Toyota Celica GT4. Uh, it's the ST205 body, the third... Uh, uh, incarnation of, well, whatever the hell it is, of this uh, this sort of series of Celicas. It's basically a JD. I hate using that term. I really hate it. It's one of the most hateful terms for me in the car world. Uh, a JDM car, which is, of course, a Japanese domestic market. Uh, when I first saw this car at the dealership, it just reminded me of how bloody annoying JDM people are. Uh, even more so than, like, the BMW or Porsche enthusiasts, which are, they're frankly bad enough, but the, the JDM people are worse. Uh, the, easily the most irritating of all car cultures. Really, really is. In fact, in a way, they're responsible for getting me out of performance cars uh, because I was a big-time car guy as a teenager, you know, with the Hot Rod Firebirds, the V8s, the Torque, the Holly Carburetors, the Tunnel Rams and Headers and Posi Tractions and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden in the early 90s, things started swinging towards these weird sort of hyper-technical overblown four-cylinder turbo things. And I just said the hell with it. And I instead got into personal luxury coupes. I went out and got a Riviera, uh, which was the single greatest car I maybe have ever owned. And uh, I just abandoned the performance car world to these people. And uh, they really are, they're like even worse than like the Android phone enthusiasts. I mean, I'm, look, I'm no, I don't care about phones, even in the slightest. They mean nothing to me. Uh, but, you know, you got to have them. They're necessary evil. And uh, for instance, little Richard, if you remember him, the sales guy, uh, he loves the Androids. He's this big Android enthusiast. He'd always come up to you when you're using your phone. He's like, oh, that... That iPhone is a piece of shit. <laughs> I mean, well, well, why? What's wrong with it? Yeah, oh, this this Android 12.7 D5 is, you know, got a 42 megapixel camera, and yeah, I, man, I don't care. But it seems like iPhone people tend to just be iPhone people, while some Android people really want to like take it to you, like it's some sort of a competition thing, and it just drives me ape shit. And somehow the JDM people seem to be even worse. They're you know, you, you get in a conversation with them. And they're like, oh, look, this 1,200 horsepower hyper-boosted Supra is way faster than a stock Shelby GT500. It's, you know, it's got a 12ZZZ E18F engine, man. It's, you know, it's badass. It's got a twist peak VVT with the 6910F porcelain turbo. And 
oh God, it's just excruciating to listen to. And uh, frankly, it just turns me off. So doing this car, I run the risk of really being hateful, uh, which obviously is very far from what my character usually is. Obviously, I'm entirely optimistic and happy most of the time. Uh, a friend of mine, Robert the Pollock, I've talked about him before. Uh, you know, he's the guy who took us drunkenly around in that Sebring hot lap in his F-250, which is absolutely insane. And uh, of course, Robert is insane. Uh, but he inelegantly describes them as dipshits with a glowy band around their neck, a Hello Kitty belt buckle, a collection of hente porno, and a rape, uh, <laughs> rape whistle up their ass. I mean, Robert is... He has a way with words in the same way that like a professional wrestler has a way with uh, folding chairs. So, uh, but you know, it, long story short, the guy is not wrong. Uh, all these JDMers think their cars are beyond sacred, beyond reproach. I mean, you just can't even uh, make fun of a, uh, you know, second or third gen Supra. They'll go absolutely ape shit. Uh, they put them on a pedestal that exceeds anything approaching their real value. And you know, some of them are pretty good cars for sure. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, but they're not above nitpicking at all. I mean, like any other car, they can be nitpicked. And, you know, they're not some patron saint that you have to bow down to. And uh, I do love pointing out, I mean, I absolutely enjoy the hell out of pointing out that, you know, a bottle of Coca-Cola has more displacement than uh, most of the Turbo 4s that they cherish so much. But... Anyway, uh, and beyond that, why are JDM cars so gaudy? I mean, unbelievably gaudy. A 240SX loaded with ricer equipment seems less tasteful than a decked out Eldorado driven by some kind of Tijuana pimp. I mean, they've got pointy four inch lug nuts and flashy neon stereos and unbelievably and needlessly ornate shifter knobs. It's just revolting. I have no idea why, and it just really freaks me out. And uh, it seems like the uh, four-wheel drive diesel truck guys have taken over that, um, the whole racer thing now. And every time I see one of those things running around, they've got like neon around the brake discs and uh, this stupid Carolina squat thing where the front end is poked up. So, uh, you know, if you want to run over a toddler, it's set up perfectly perfectly to do that. And for whatever reason, they seem to be the new ricers, even down to the whole fart can thing, uh, which of course the JDM people invented. And the fart can is that stupid, big, you know, bazooka looking exhaust coming out the rear bumper, uh, which, um, you know, again, these are all just things which turned me off against the whole culture and uh, sent me running, packing, flying towards Buick Rivieras. And uh, there you go. On top of that, they invented the whole drift thing in racing, which I know people like, but frankly, it's really just stupid. I mean, extended oversteer around the racetrack is not going to set a lap record. <laughs> it's just not. I mean, oversteer is great fun, and it has its use in racing, you know, if you want to set the car up for the next straightaway. Uh, but for the most part, it just slows you down. Uh, so what is the entire, what, what is the friggin' point of drifting other than pure exhibitionism, which, uh, uh, again, I just don't get it all. It just seems ridiculously gratuitous to me. Uh, but that said, look, one can't discuss JDM without discussing Japanese culture at large and uh, bringing up Japan in general. And when one thinks of Japan, uh, the first things that come to mind are, you know, comfort women, bukkake, ramen noodles, yoko ono, seppuku, kamikazes, sushi, uh, you could also throw in samurai swords, square watermelon, uh, kind of fat-ass goldfish that seem to swim around, uh, the anti-grope buses for teenage girls and ambitious corporate takeovers. So um, they really are a truly terrifying culture, the Japanese. I have to say that. I, I mean, they make the Germans look kind of normal, and it's no wonder to me at all that they teamed up at one point. Uh, it really isn't. They're unbelievable people. Uh, but I will say one of my favorite movies of all 
time is called Wangan Midnight. Uh, this is one that I found while I was running around. I don't know what the hell I was doing. I was searching around YouTube and this thing popped up. Uh, like the full movie is on YouTube. I'll link it if it's still there. And I love this thing. Uh, this little Japanese gearhead kid goes to a junkyard, not unlike Corvette Summer and Mark Hamill. And uh, there's this crashed, screwed up, 240Z. You have to ignore the fact that they have like a 2 plus 2 that's crashed that then becomes a two-seater later, you know, all the stuff that you wonder why people would even take the... If you're going to make a movie, take the time to do it right, especially if cars are the focus. But anyway, he finds this thing in the junkyard. It's got some fancy engine. His friends all warn him against it and say, oh my god, no, that's the Devil Z. You don't want to take that car. But he does, and he restores it. And uh, it turns out that it's this possessed and wicked evil car that kills whoever drives it and uh, he uses it against some hopped up Porsche 930 driven by a surgeon uh, called the Blackbird which is some kind of famous Wangen midnight car and uh, the whole Wangen thing I guess that's some highway in Japan where street racers meet in the middle of the night it's not unlike bonsai racing in the United States uh, where uh, you know these hopped up cars come together they meet by chance and then do these mad two 200 mile an hour dashes uh, across the desert to race. And uh, anyway, he races Blackbird, and for whatever reason, him and the car attract this whole series of, uh, you know, JDM supermodels who find him and the car attractive, and I just love it. I love watching them. I love watching the cars. I could watch that movie a hundred times. It's just absolutely fantastic. But I digress. So look, let's just get into this thing. This is a sixth generation Celica. And the Celica started, believe it or not, as kind of a Japanese Mustang back in the 70s. And it, you know, it did pretty well. And in fact, they've really gained collectability today. Uh, you know, that molded into maybe a Japanese Camaro uh, in the 1980s when, you know, they retained the rear wheel drive thing, but they became a little bit more sleek, uh, you know, lower to the ground, less like a, you know, kind of a tall coupe and more like sort of a low slung Camaro type thing and uh, I did a um, in fact I'll link to that too there's going to be some links in this description uh, we did a Celica GTS convertible a couple of months ago maybe three or four uh, that was great fun and uh, that was uh, that was a just a, yeah, it was just a neat car to have um, but then everything changed so after that rear drive thing went away out came the front wheel drive thing uh, in the United States and it started with the ST165 Celica I'm not going to get into all these years. I, I, I mean, I just hate all this stuff. I really do. The, the Mercedes and BMW chassis numbers are irritating enough, but Toyotas are worse somehow to me. And uh, anyway, it got into this front wheel drive stuff and Toyota was doing fantastically well. They were making a lot of money. Uh, their engineering prowess was growing. Uh, they were becoming a quite successful and very powerful car company and they decided that they wanted to get they were already in racing but they decided that they wanted to really start having success in racing and uh, one of the big racing setups at the time more so in Europe and across the world was uh, the World Rally Championship I don't think it was called that then but it's basically that same circuit and Toyota wanted to be strong in it so uh, they took that first gen front wheel drive Celica and they created an all-wheel drive system and uh, use some tuning from Yamaha on the head and made a rally car and it started to have pretty good success and then uh, the second gen came out which I believe is the ST 185 and that just absolutely took it to the limit all of a sudden the car was extremely competitive in the rally class uh, it started beating the Europeans uh, there was a version of that car here called the all track and uh, not too many of them and and, you know, frankly, again, in America, we weren't really concerned with World Rally Championships any more than we were Formula One or any other kind of international racing. We we're still mostly into NASCAR and Indy and that sort of thing. So it was only kind of a small, dedicated group of fans here, uh, like it was for European soccer or you know, cricket or, you know, even Formula One back then didn't have a huge American fan base. Uh, but Toyota started taking it to the Europeans. And the ST180 Corolla with its engine and with its uh, kind of hopped up all-wheel drive drivetrain started 
winning and winning races and beating the Euros at their own game and eventually took home the uh, championship, which was the first time an all-wheel drive turbo Japanese car did that. Uh, you know, Nissan and Subaru and their Skylines and WRXs and, and Mitsubishi with its uh, Gallants and VR4s and all that stuff, they came later, but Toyota was the first uh, with the uh, Celica and the all-wheel drive. And it worked really, really well for them and brought them fame and fortune. And they wanted that to continue. So this thing came out, I want to say in 93 or 94, and it's the ST205 Celica. And uh, it was the last hurrah, really, for the... I mean, the Celica went on until 2006. But as far as racing goes, this gen, this ST205, was sort of their last real hurrah. And it was very, very competitive. And uh, we'll get into the engine and all that sort of thing and why it was. Uh, but... Um, all right, well, here it is. Look, uh, while it was one of the most significant cars in rally history, it's more famous now for what was probably the greatest, certainly the greatest rally scandal of all time, and truly one of the greatest motorsports cheating scandals of all time. And I really have to hand it to Toyota for this. Uh, after the success of the prior gen Celica, other companies started picking up their pace. You know, Audi's always on their game. Porsche was out there. Uh, the Japanese engineers of Toyota, and uh, frankly, the German engineers in the Toyota European uh, motor division that put the rally cars together, the racing division, uh, they decided that they needed an edge. <laughs> And they came up with it in a fantastic way. Truly one of the great motorsports cheats of all times. Uh, there are things called, uh, see if I can make this, you know, uh, dumb enough for me to understand. Uh, there are things called restrictor plates. And I even have one in the spec Miata. And the point of them in the spec Miata is that they make all generations of Miatas roughly have the same performance. That's at least the theory. And what they do is they bolt on the intake and limit the amount of air flow into an engine. Uh, well, at the time, uh, not in order to make cars more competitive with each other, rally people were worried about all the nutbag fans that were lining all the courses. I mean, uh, I'll put up a couple of pictures of it, but I mean, everybody's seen it. You've got these rally cars doing insane speeds around dirt corners and forests and gullies, and you've got all of these nut jobs lining the course right on the edge of the road, just waiting to get run over by one of these cars when it loses control and uh, they you know obviously that sort of started to worry the officials so one of the ways that they came up with addressing that was putting these restrictor plates on the turbos that would lower their horsepower and uh, Toyota came out with this restrictor plate that was beyond ingenious absolutely ingenious it was just brilliant uh, it was here's why it was brilliant when it was installed what it would do was put pressure on the restrictor plate using these kind of Bellevue springs or whatever the hell it used and all of a sudden it would allow more airflow it would come it was good for like 50 horsepower and you're talking about these cars had like 300 on them so 50 was quite a lot but when it would be uninstalled for inspection uh, the springs that would move to open up the restrictor plate would pop back hard and look just like normal retainer springs that were holding the plate in place so a guy looking at it I mean these are pretty crafty inspectors who are looking at these things. They're, I mean, they're yeah, very high level looking for cheats and stuff. Very tough for them to notice that only when installed would this thing open up. It was, I mean, if Toyota put this sort of engineering into legally winning, they might have just done so. Uh, but uh, it was absolutely brilliant, but uh, who knows, maybe a whistleblower let the cat out of the bag or something. But uh, FIA president, the, the body that sanctions this racing, his name was Max Mosley at the time. Uh, he said it was the most sophisticated device he'd seen in 30 years of motorsports. I mean, he sounds genuinely impressed. And, uh, you know, honestly, in some ways, it's more impressive than they had just won fairly. So, uh, all right, look, so th there it is. Uh, very quickly, the point of this GT4 as a 
car. It was a homologation special. They made 2,500 of them uh, in this series, and the, uh, they had to make that many to release to the consumers so that they could run it in this Group A rally class. Uh, that's famous through the years. The Porsche 959, that was another homologation thing. And uh, they, uh, if you remember that Pontiac Grand Prix with the aero back window uh, for NASCAR, they had to run uh, a few of those to the, um, the consumer buyer to be able to use them at NASCAR. So it's, it's you know, an ongoing thing. And the GT4 was that. Uh, in this gen, the 2500 never came to the United States. They only came, and there was a bunch in Japan, uh, like 70 or so got sent to Australia, and then a few more to Europe. But it was enough to make the car legal to run in that class. And that's part of what makes it so rare and special today. And frankly, it's so rare rare and special, it's underappreciated and undervalued. I mean, in so many ways, it's a much more significant car than the uh, Supra that everybody freaks out about. Uh, you know, even the Supra, by the way, that won the uh, Japanese touring car stuff was using the engine out of this car, not that famous six cylinder that everybody loves, but we'll get into that in a minute. So um, here it is. And this one, this JDM product, which is right hand drive, which I'll get into why that annoyed the hell out of me today and yesterday uh, is uh, is ready for um, for looking at. So anyway, I'm going to pause for a minute, get my shit together, and then we're going to dive and leap directly into this specific car. All right, so let's just get into this thing. Here at the back, uh, one thing that fascinates me, again, about JDM products and Japanese cars in general, is they all seem to have American, well, I guess that's not exactly correct, they all seem to have English badges on them. Uh, I don't know that I've ever seen a Japanese car that had Japanese lettering on the badging. I mean, this thing is a Japanese domestic product, this car, and uh, it says GT4 on the back and Celica and, uh, you know, even a t it's Z. I mean, a famous Japanese thing has... There's no Z in the Japanese alphabet, or at least not uh, the way it's written. So uh, Japan does seem to borrow uh, English nomenclature for their vehicles. Uh, this thing with its big rear wing, here's what pains me about this. Uh, on this GT4, this homologation special, this is a factory wing with those risers that make it lift up higher than it would normally. Uh, but to the people on the street, of course, many of whom, I would say 99.99% .99 of whom, have no idea what this car is. Uh, it looks like why well, one of these nitwit ricers running around with a suspension bridge on his rear deck. You know, they, oh God, there goes another one of those guys. Uh, man, they... <laughs> What are you going to do? But um, but anyway, there it is. This this was one of the cars, assumedly, uh, that uh, created the whole big wing at the back thing that has now been taken with and run with to the point of stupidity. And uh, you just see them going around the streets all the time. Uh, after this car, by the way, came the Subaru WRX, which is much more famous, and the uh, Mitsubishi Evo, uh, also more famous. Uh, but this car was first, and uh, even if... Uh, they brought, um, those two cars brought rally racing into the American mainstream. Uh, this car predated them and uh, frankly was pretty cool. And even the prior gen, the uh, uh, Toyota Alltrack uh, Celica predated this one. And uh, when you see one of those things driving around, you have to give that guy credit. He really knows what's what. But anyway, let's have a look inside. So we'll check inside the uh, trunk first, just because that's historically what we do. And now I start to hear the birds again going ape shit. Let's see if I can even lift this thing up with this crazy rear wing. Oh, God. Okay, yeah, that is heavy. Uh, here in the back, this is a very nice area to keep a toddler or a baby. There's no question at all. Uh, you stuff one of them in here, and he is not getting out. He's got this thing, whatever the hell it is. I guess this is a brace between the rear struts, the suspension, to keep everything stiff. Uh, he can cling on to that if you start doing some heavy cornering or whatnot, so he'll be safe that way. Uh, the rear seats do fold down, so if you want to keep an eye on him, you can do that. 
and uh, otherwise when you put the hatch down it's got that nice little lid on it so uh, you can keep them nice and safe for her you know I guess we have to be PC about this uh, you know in the back and uh, you know not in any sort of trouble so it's good stuff uh, here you see the original steering wheel with the car obviously that's something no JDM fan is gonna let stand uh, they're gonna have to put some kind of a nitwitty uh, quick disconnect racing wheel on their right-hand drive Japanese car in order to feel more proper uh, but at least the person who did that with this kept the original uh, steering wheel and it's here in the back so Anyway, everything lovely there, but uh, let's have a look under the hood because truly that's the most significant part of this car. And where the hell is the release? All right, there it is. Love that big uh, air vent there on the top. That's kind of cool. And it's a very light hood. It reminds me of the Miata a little bit. Let's see if I can find the prop rod here. Uh, because it's aluminum and of course lightweight and uh, it has all of these sort of swoops and vents and it's got rear vents and front vents and uh, apparently in one of the incarnations it had some sort of a front hood spoiler that ran above the wipers but I haven't seen that. This is a 3S GTE engine. Uh, it, 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 some people would argue, and I'm not going to be one of them uh, because I just don't have a horse in the race, uh, that it's the best engine Toyota ever built. I don't look, man, don't send shards and missiles my way. I'm just repeating what I heard. Uh, it's certainly one of the most storied, if not the most storied and successful racing engines uh, that Toyota ever made. It was made for 23 years. Uh, it's the third generation of the S engine that came out in the mid-1980s. Uh, when Toyota decided that they needed a big four-cylinder uh, that they could run in some of their sedans and then later it got used for racing. In fact, uh, they shortened the stroke, increased the bore, made it more potent, and then hired Yamaha uh, to do the head work on it. Uh, they did that in a prior generation first and that really started pumping out the horsepower. Uh, and of course it is turbocharged. This one does have some sort of a twin entry turbo. Uh, another phrase these guys probably like to use. Uh, but it is probably their best and most famous racing engine. Uh, in fact, everybody talks about that uh, 2JZ engine uh, from the Supra, that six-cylinder. Well, in the Japanese touring car championships in the 90s, the early 90s, maybe the late 80s, uh, they were running Supras, but the Skylines, the Nissan Skylines, were kicking everybody's ass. So Toyota removed the legendary 2JZ6 and put in one of these, a 3S GTE, hopped up turbo, took it to the Skylines and beat them. And for what it's worth, by the way, Japanese touring car is a pretty big deal. It's like NASCAR in Japan, but without the chewing tobacco. And uh, those four cylinders put out the same horsepower as the sixes, but they were much, much lighter. And uh, that helped propel those uh, Supras to the uh, uh, top of the podium and uh, took out the Skylines that were absolutely winning everything for years. So it was a very big deal. And yet another sort of, you know, exhibit A in one this may be uh, Toyota's sort of best racing engine. Um, it's just epic. It's absolutely. In this incarnation, it either has 252 or 230 horse, depending on uh, whether it was a JDM release or it was one of the export cars. Uh, the Japanese ones had the 252, and I do believe this is a Japanese. Somebody's going to correct me on all this crap, but I'd like to say right now, I, you know, I'm just not an expert in this stuff at all. Even to do this video, I had to go back and do a lot of reading to refresh myself and learn new things, uh, you know, about why uh, these cars are special. So don't beat me up for Christ's sake. Uh, I know that I run the risk of offending, you know, the most obnoxious car enthusiast segment in world history so um, good lord I understand there's people like Beyonce fans who shake their head and say man those guys are dedicated uh, but anyway this engine was in a variety of sports cars for Toyota uh, including by the way the mid-engined MR2 and uh, you know the um, uh, the Celica all kinds of stuff it was it was a pretty prolific and it made it into sedans and other stuff but in terms of racing it absolutely 
really kicked ass. So, uh, and again, in the spirit of JDM guys, this is the 3S GTE, man. It's a, you know, third generation S engine and it's got that uh, CT20B twin entry turbocharger, you know, really pumps it up, man. It's, you know, it's kick ass. And that's all going through this E154 close ratio five speed, man. Holy shit. And uh, yeah, there it is. So that's the way these guys talk and it just drives me ape shit. But anyway, all of that was accurate. Uh, they also used... Uh Here's one thing that I think is very cool about these cars is, again, these were very early all-wheel drive turbo cars. And now all of the all-wheel drive systems are hyper-technical, computer-controlled crap that does all sorts of torque vectoring to either the front or the back. And it takes a lot of driver involvement out of it. But not so with these things. Uh, you know, the prior Gen Celica Alltrack and this one, uh, they're basically a 50-50 split. Some of them had uh, limited split. I think these homologation cars did. Uh, they, they perfectly balanced between the front and rear, and it was all analog. You know, it was you, you felt the way the car would connect on the gravel or the dirt or, you know, running through the African continent or driving over, you know, Finnish mountains or, you know, wherever the hell they ran these things. And uh, the driver got to have a great thrill and was very well connected to the road. Uh, it also used a very special uh, and uh, exotic uh, strut system up front to combine with the steering to reduce understeer. It's a, uh, I think Ford uses it now uh, and it's very fancy and that's why a lot of people never used it. But uh, it was one of the first all-wheel drive cars and front-wheel drive cars that could really reduce the insane sort of uh, turbo-induced over, or sorry, uh, torque steer uh, that front-wheel drive cars had, and that makes it pretty damn cool. Um, it, uh, again, did compete in the Class A rally. You had 2,500 of them produced, and uh, all in all, it's pretty neat stuff and a legendary Toyota engine. Uh, let's get that back down, and now we'll just sort of take in the cosmetics of this car. Toyota really had a lot of money back then and really good build quality. And I get the feeling that these kind of things were just fun for them, you know? I mean, and their reputation now, Toyota, is really boring. I mean, they're still in motorsports. I believe they're still in F1. Uh, they're still in NASCAR. They're still in Le Mans class stuff and all sorts of things, but nobody really knows them for it. They just know all the uh, boring crap that Toyota <laughs> makes for the American market. A lot of them made in America. And uh, truly, some of the other makers, like Subaru, uh, have um, have won the day in terms of uh, people thinking of their cars as more performance oriented, but not so in the 90s. I would say that this sort of the 80, late 80s to mid to late 90s were the heyday for uh, Toyota's racing products and uh, them being thought of as uh, being pretty cool within the realm of motorsports, certainly at least in the rest of the world, uh, if not as much in the United States. Uh, I've always felt the front end of these cars had a bit of a spider eye look with, uh, you know, this one I believe has a, uh, after it's probably JDM, uh, front spoiler underneath the bumper. It could be factory. Honestly, I just don't know. Uh, but you've got driving lights in the grill, uh, the lower grill. You've got these additional uh, driving lights at the front of the uh, bumper at the top, the header panel of the bumper there, if you will. So you've got six lights. It almost looks like some kind of spider eyes or something. It's just kind of freakish looking. Uh, it also has a little bit of a bulging bodywork. You've got flares on the front fenders. You've got bigger flares on the back. Uh, the aluminum hood has four different air inlets. You've got uh, the proper ones on the left and right for reverse, probably to let engine heat out. Uh, you've got uh, a big uh, forced induction looking thing here. I have no idea how it works exactly, but that obviously brings air in. And uh, then this big vent here, uh, which presumably works in tandem with those two vents to keep under hood uh, kind of cooler. And that is obviously something you need in rally racing. Uh, these are Enki rims, another JDM company. Uh, I don't think they are the original rims to the car at all. In fact, I'm quite sure they're not, but um, yeah, they look fine and they are what they are. Uh, the side rocker panels with the uh, curvature in the front and the back look quite nice. They're kind of cool. Uh, you've got the uh, Celica badging running down the bottom of the uh, door panel into the rear quarter. Uh, it's got, uh, what the hell does this even say? It's hard to see. Emotional, what the hell? 
I should have looked at this before. Emotional sharp dynamism. What I do? Again, you know, thank God these people lost World War II. But uh, anyway, there it is. We've got all kinds of uh, fingerprints, probably for me, on the door here. Let me wipe those off. Almost like a crime scene. Some kind of aluminum on it, and all of a sudden the birds are going ape shit. Uh, going into the back again, you've got that wing with the risers. You can even see where they're just sort of bolted on. They must have found some very long bolts for that, uh, because otherwise this red part of the wing uh, would bolt quite happily to the deck lid. So uh, <clears throat> that was just a little added something in order to make the wing taller and presumably create more downforce. Uh, I'm not sure if that big fart can looking thing under the bumper is factory or not. Probably not. And and, uh, you know, again, a part of what drives me nuts about the the whole JDM thing. So I tell you what, uh, let's just, um, let's just get, I'm going to get my crap together, get it in the back of the car. Then we're going to hop in and go for a spin. All right, we're going to take the back seats for granted. I mean, just assume you can fit a couple of Canadians back there. Uh, but, uh, you know, every 80s and 90s Japanese Econo boxes like the other. You're gonna have little cloth back seats with high build quality. So let's just uh, let's just go for a ride. Okay. Other side, yeah, right-hand drive. I tend to forget that. And I have no idea why Japan is right-hand drive. I mean, I get that the British are insane and weird, and that's why they do it. And, uh, of course, that's why Australia does it as well. But at least Canada and the United States and other proper British colonies, former British colonies, decided to put the steering wheel on the correct side, as did Germany and most of continental Europe. Uh, why Japan and uh, Hong Kong and... Anyway, uh, it just makes it more miserable for me. So anyway, while we're here, here is the passenger side of the car uh, with the, um, I don't know what the hell is in the glove box, all kinds of crap back there. Uh, here's a quick look at the back seats. Um, as I said, you know, high build quality, boring cloth uh, where you could fit some Canadians who are going to be semi-chipper uh, to be in the back of a uh, rally winning car. Uh, door panels, typical Japanese stuff. Again, you know, nice uh, materials, cheap but nice, well made, good fit and finish, bulletproof and, you know, obviously they're going to last forever. So, All right, let's get over and do it. I have to say, this right-hand drive stuff just absolutely freaks me out. I'm not very good at it. Uh, as I've mentioned before, I lived in Ireland for a while. I did not have a car there, uh, but my sister lived there at the same time, and she did. She had some sort of Volvo 440 sedan hatchback looking thing that I don't think they released here at the time, and I had to drive that. And because I was in college and I was in Ireland, I was drunk all the time and on hash a good number of the times. And uh, what I tended to do was put the entire uh I'm going to call it the driver's side, but the left side of the car I used to put up on the sidewalk because uh, when I'm in that lane over there, I just wanted to be towards the left of the lane. Uh, for some reason, when I'm sitting uh, on the left side of a car, the correct driver's side of a car, <laughs> we get a lot of flag for all that, but whatever, uh, it feels normal to me. When I'm in a right-hand drive car, it feels like I'm sitting on some kind of a little ledge that's outside the door on the, you know, set up on the door handle like one of those monkey mechanics from early days of racing. I can't believe how far to the right it feels. <sighs> this is gonna be weird. All right, let me get this. So here's the ignition over here. And then yesterday when I was driving at home, instead of using turn signals, I hit the wipers like 43 times. And something's beeping. I think it's the stupid radio, but we'll get into that in a minute. All right, let me move this thing forward so we're out of the sun for a moment. It still feels sunny. All right, let's go up more. Now well, this still feels sunny. Oh, well, whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay, so look. Here we've got a sort of an interesting and very minimally laid out instrument cluster. Let me get my seatbelt on. You've got your tack over to the left. You've got your 180 kilometer per hour 
uh, speedometer. This one's showing 134,000 kilometers on the clock. As we all know, the metric system is a tool of the devil. Uh, you've got a temperature gauge, you've got a boost gauge there, and you've got a fuel gauge. Uh, as I pointed out before, you've got this Momo steering wheel with an NRG, energy quick release, which, uh, you know, there's guys who take their airbags off to put these on. It seems brilliant to me, but whatever. And honestly, what do you need a quick release for unless you live in some sort of a high crime district where not having a steering wheel when you park at night is a benefit? Uh, it also has hilarious little carbon fiber um, grippity flip pads here on your, well, they're not flippities, but whatever, that you can put your thumb on this carbon fiber thing, uh, which is lighter than if it were aluminum, so it's brilliant. More carbon fiber. <laughs> Apparently the horn works, and uh, of course here is your wiper stock, which I've hit 50 times thinking I'm using the turn signals, and here are your lights and turn signals uh, where I would never think to use them. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the Japanese are insane, and by the way, this car is not complete, and I'll tell you why. Number one, it doesn't have some big ridiculous six inch monster tack bolted to the top of the dashboard. It doesn't have some sort of Sparco hard as a board racing seats uh, with neon harnesses with little Japanese cats on them. So uh, that is a big oversight on whoever owned this car. Uh, they did, however, get the correct insane and bizarre Japanese stereo in this thing, uh, which has uh, a Lucite cap on the top of it and neon and strange lighting and silver knobs uh, and it's irritating as all be. First of all, I couldn't get the CD to work. It wouldn't suck it in. That was my only shot at getting music apparently because otherwise I don't really have any mini discs hanging around which it takes there and when I go to the radio, let me see if I can do that. There's an auxiliary I can't find. Yeah, here's the tuner. All right, so where am I at? It, oh yeah, yeah, channel 86. Oh no, here's 83, 80, 76. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing. And then when I seek, there it is. The only channel I can get is Christian Rock. Let me do that again. And I'm sorry, I just can't, I, I there is something about, I mean, they, if they played Striper, maybe I could put up with it, but they don't. And I don't know who this is. The volume's over here on the right. Yeah, I mean, come on, total vomitorium. Uh, it's also connected to some sort of, I, I don't know if this is a 90s era uh, memory card down here, which again, I'm fresh out of, so no help there. Uh, apparently the Japanese versions of these uh, homologation cars had this uh, uh, automatic climate control, which actually let me get going. I really have to get that going because it is getting to be a little bit friggin' hot right now. Uh, and that uh, is what tips me off to making it think this is a Japanese model. Uh, the ones that were exported had a manual climate control, although they did have this as an option, I guess. And uh, you could also get the sunroof, which this appears to have. Um, here in the uh, center console is, of course, the shifter, that five-speed manual gearbox, close ratio. And it takes me a little while to get used to uh, shifting. And now I've got to move back because the gates didn't... There we go. Okay, so I tell you what, look, I'm going to pause it and then we're going to take it up at the end of the road. Uh, because I can't even blame Dalton for the windshield today. It's going to look shitty because of my windshield wiper issues. Uh, but anyway, we'll pick it up down there. Hold on a minute. Uh, well, I should have kept it going because interestingly, that woman who walks her dog with the weird hat carrying the bag of shit, uh, unlike every other time where she kind of waves at me and looks at me friendly, uh, this time she didn't because I'm driving one of these ricer cars and virtually everybody knows that it's street hoodlums who drive these things. Ah, for the mother of God. I will say it's actually easier doing this than it is cross-shifting with my... Uh, uh, with my left hand when I'm, you know, driving a manual gearbox with the camera on a uh, left-hand drive car. So it's got that going for it. But God, I'm just not used to any of this. I mean, oh, God. Okay, there it is. There's the wipers again. I will never get I could drive this car for six months and still not get used to that. Um, you know, the engine with the turbo, and again, I don't know if it has any kind of upgraded exhaust or this, that, the other. It's got all that spitty, hissy, you know, pressure relief stuff that you're always hearing in these cars. 
all sorts of grinding and winding. Oh good, we're gonna get a um, shot off the traffic light. So all right, I'm gonna pause it here so you don't have to wait through the traffic light and uh, then we'll do a little acceleration run when it turns green. sounds are and the hissing and spitting and oh god it's such a thing that that I just don't know give me V8 torque and rumble and growl and I'm just a much happier guy I truly am but uh, oh god anyway look here it is so this is a 94 Toyota Celica GT4 uh, again this Gen, this ST205 never came to the United States. Uh, you know, Japan and the Euros kept it for themselves. And uh, it was a very, very significant uh, racing history, racing legend car that's not really widely known today other than by a few psychophants and other rally enthusiast weirdos, and God bless them. Uh, so, you know, the people driving around looking at this thing think I'm just some kind of nitwit ricer with a fart can and a big wing and uh, they have no idea that I'm driving an incredibly significant you know bit of Toyota and rally car history so the hell with them at least I know it uh, this one is for sale at uh, at Auto House apparently the new owner there has some kind of a thing for ricer cars I guess even though he's older than me so I don't know why uh, and uh, it's gonna be um, when he's done playing with with it, he's going to put it up for sale. So if you have an interest, you can give those guys a call, 239-263-8500 uh, uh, on the web at uh, autohousenaples.com. That was very dangerous because I don't know my corners on this right-hand drive stuff. Uh, thank you for having a look. Really appreciate it. Uh, hope to have a Mark V for tomorrow, but eh, who knows? Depends on whether or not we get the carb on it and uh, otherwise some other fun stuff coming up. So uh, really appreciate it. I see I'm closing in on the 100K on the subscriber front, which is absolutely astounding to me. Uh, it just makes me know that there's a lot of really troubled people out there and uh, God bless them for being that way. So uh, thanks again and uh, we'll uh, see you soon with the next one. Take care. If I wanted to start a new career in rural mail delivery, this car would be a great place to start.